everyone, and welcome to our seventh Skeptics in the Pub online event. If this is your first time joining us, just to explain who we are, we are a not not profit organization dedicated to the promotion of science, reason, and critical thinking. Now, back in the world before COVID, we used to operate as independent groups across the UK and Europe, meeting up on a regular basis to hear interesting talks. But thanks to the plague, many of us have come together to form one supergroup to try and keep our community going and bring you entertaining and informative talks every Thursday. If you haven't already, please feel free to introduce yourself in the Twitch chat, tell us where you're joining us from, and most importantly, tell us what you're drinking. The format for the evening is we will have a talk from our wonderful guest speaker, which will last approximately 45 minutes. We will then have a short break, followed by a question and answer session. Then, after that, we'll be opening a Zoom call for anyone who wants to join us. If you do want to submit a question for our speaker, please submit, submit them via the Slido app. And the link for that is sli.do forward slash angel. But don't worry, our lovely moderators will be sharing the link to that in the chat throughout the night. The moderators will also be sharing some other useful links, including a link to our PayPal account. So if you'd like to help us with running costs, any donations would be greatly appreciated. Tonight, we're joined by Angel Russell who is coming to us all the way from Florida. Angel is a certified sex educator, research sexologist, certified sexual assault victims advocate and author with over eight years experience as a sexuality educator. They're also the co-host of an excellent podcast called Sex From A To Z, which is available on all the usual platforms and I highly recommend in giving that a listen. Now please fill the chat with clap emojis and welcome to the screen, Angel Russell. Hello. That was a really nice welcome. Thank you. All right. Let me <laughs> see if I can do this. I'm going to X out of here. <laughs> um, I am really excited to be here. This is super cool. Um, I'm going to do something that might be um, a little annoying. I'm used to having like live events where there's someone in the back of the room to signal me when I hit like a five minutes left mark. So I've just started myself a little alarm. So in 40 minutes, when you hear that noise, it's just me keeping track of time because I'm a talker. <laughs> um, so I, uh, all right. So what are we doing here? Uh, if you came for Bible study, maybe this is not the right place. Um, that's not what we're doing today. Uh, <laughs> we are going to talk about sex. Um, specifically, what we're going to talk about is how our brains process sexual cues and how that gets communicated to our bodies. So we're going to talk about desire and libido and, um, I'm going to start by laying some groundwork on anatomy because we want to talk about how our brains and bodies talk to each other. And sometimes that goes really well. And sometimes that goes wrong. Usually the kind of work I do is when somebody is having a frustrating experience with their sexuality and they want like a fix or they want a solution. And so then they come to me and we can work through it. Um, and so I've really dedicated a lot of my time and energy and education in understanding these mechanisms. Um, I am really passionate about sex science and I'm excited to communicate this stuff to you in this format. Um, I am coming to you from Jacksonville, Florida, and I am drinking a uh, French press coffee in my professor sex mug that I, um, ordered for myself, uh, because I was really excited when I, um, started this brand. So I've been doing sex ed for, yeah, about eight years. Um, but I, I kind of launched out and started taking clients on my own and working as like my own brand. Um, about, I guess it's been about three years that professor sex has existed. So, um, let's do a little, like, what is like, who am I? Why should you, what even is professor sex? So, uh, professor sex is like I used to say that I am Professor Sex, but really it's gotten to be a lot bigger than me. There is a whole team of us now, which is a really exciting, cool thing. Um, we are a sexuality education resource, and we're really geared for folks who are late adolescents or adults. Um, I, we don't really teach sex ed to kids. Sometimes we can adapt what we're doing for teens or folks kind of in that puberty phase. Um Partly because I've had to learn to adapt because I have kids that are those ages. And so now they're asking me these questions and I'm thinking, well, I usually answer these questions to grownups and the answers you get are going to be a little different. So um, like why teach to adults? Uh, I started um, doing sex ed. I was selling 
sex toys in these in-home parties, like Tupperware parties, where you invite um, someone to come into your house. It's like the multi-level marketing things, or you know, you invite somebody in and they have a product to sell, and you do a little party with your friends, and they sell you the product, and then you guys all buy from this person. And um, I was doing that, but it was it wasn't Tupperware; it was sex toys, and. I did it because I had stuff going on with my kids during the day. I needed something I could do at night. And folks would ask me all of these questions about their sex lives because it was probably the first time ever that they had been given permission to just explicitly talk about their sex lives. And I didn't have that information. I had, this was, you know, about eight, nine years ago. And I, I knew all the stuff in the catalog. So I knew how many speeds all the toys had. And I, you know, knew what price points I could discount and how much shipping was. But in terms of helping people work through the problems or questions they had about their sexuality, about their relationships, I just wasn't qualified and I wanted to be. And so I started just devouring any education I could around the subject. And then when I was um, going through my divorce, my ex-husband, we had a very amicable divorce. Um, He said, if you go to grad school and really do this, I'll let you have the house and you and the kids can go be in the house and not have to worry about any of that. And you can do grad school and really focus. And it was such a gift. Um, and so I, I moved, you know, the kids and I were in the house and I did the single mom grad school thing. And I have, uh, a master's degree sort of different story, but I have a master's degree in psychological science. So I didn't go into therapy. I went into psych research and my focus in research has really been, um, sexual identity, sexual behavior. Um, how do people integrate their identity or integrate their sexual desires and their sexual fantasies and their sexuality and their gender? How does all that become integrated into your identity? So that's where a lot of my research has been. Um, and so I, I just love it. Um, so professor sex sort of came out of that. I had been sharing all this stuff on my Facebook page and, uh, my family was a little like, we don't follow you on Facebook to hear about sex all the time. And so I had to like quarantine the sex information to like another space in the universe. And that's where professor sex came. It's actually an X-Men reference because I do a lot of work with, um, folks sort of in the margins of sexuality. So folks in the LGBT community, folks in the BDSM and kink communities, folks in non-monogamous communities. And so a lot of my focus has been, uh, in, in the, in the margins, the X-Men of the sexuality universe. And so professor sex was just meant to be a cute, um, pun. Uh, so what do we do? Our team, we are really dedicated to bringing medically accurate information. Um, I don't know what the, what the laws are like where you guys are at, but here in the U S sex ed is not mandatory and where sex ed is offered it is not, there is no federal mandate that it has to be medically accurate. And so a lot of times folks get um, sex education that has a not, that has an agenda, that has a social agenda. And so um, sometimes a religious agenda. And so there's a lot of, of myth, once somebody hits adulthood and they're actually living this stuff, they end up having to unpack all of that bad information that they got. And so we're really committed to making sure that what we're doing is medically accurate, evidence-based. So um, if I say something and you're like, I want to see the source on that, I want you to cite your source. I do a lot of that in the slides, but if I didn't and you want to see a source, I will make sure to provide that for you. And if I can't, then we'll go from there. Um, Pleasure inclusive. So that's one thing that's also missing from sex ed um, is is information about pleasure, but information about pleasure tells us a lot about consent and tells us a lot about what we want and who we are as people. So pleasure is a big part of that and it should not be missing. So I include that. Um, again, it's consent focused and it's inclusive and affirming. So, um, and we'll, you'll get to see a lot of how that looks as I teach. Um, and we offer this across a wide variety of platforms. We also have the podcast, like they said, um, during my, uh, introduction that made me blush a little, that was really nice. Um, So if you're just like, I want to see more um, after the talk, not now, hang in there with us, go to professorsex.com and all the resources are there and you can see writing and watch YouTube videos and listen to the podcast and join us in social media. We have a bunch of discussion groups and so yeah, um, so that's that. So now we're going to kind of get into our talk. Um, I, uh, hopefully you guys have something to like write something down. If you do have a question, we do have to save those to the end because of the format, Um, so, and I will do my absolute best to answer everybody's questions when the time comes for that. Um, before we get to the brain stuff, I do want to lay a little bit of foundation about the, um, the body stuff. So, and just make sure that we're all using the same language. 
um, because it, it does play those things work together, our brains and our bodies. And I want to make sure that we're, that when we wrap the talk up, we're able to connect those dots in ways that are relatable and meaningful. So let's start with a little anatomy. Um, a lot of this information is coming from a book called Come As You Are by Dr. Emily Nagoski and also the research that informed that book. So in some cases I was able, I've been able throughout my career to go to the research that uh, Dr. Nagoski and other folks have used. Um, but basically, we're all made of the same stuff. It just, it's all arranged differently on our bodies. Um, and that becomes important as we kind of move through this talk. When we're talking about um, sex, we're talking about issues of physiology, we're talking about issues of biology, we're talking about chromosomes and hormones and genitals and secondary sex characteristics like um, breast development, uh, Adam's apple, that kind of thing. The things that happen to your body during puberty, those are your secondary sex characteristics. So those are the biological components that make up your sex. And your gender is psychological. So it's the, the way that you relate psychologically to your... Um, not just to your body and to your sexuality, but also to social messages about gender. Because we can't, there's no way to completely separate our inherent sense of gender from social messages. From the time we're born, we're given social scripts about what gender is and what gender should look like. And so how well you do or do not relate to the scripts that have been ascribed to you tends to be like how our gender is processed psychologically. We're not going to spend a ton of time on the difference between sex and gender, but I just wanted to kind of lay that foundation that neither, none of your physiology is inherently male or female. Male and female are concepts of gender and that's all psychological. So all the stuff I'm saying could apply to anybody of any gender. I'm going to be talking about your bodies. I'm going to be talking about your brains. And if there's a distinction where we're using language like male or female, I'm going to do my best to talk about like what that might mean, because not all researchers have made these distinctions, not all educators have made these distinctions. And so we're doing our best to try to elevate the discussion and say, okay, like these things aren't inherently any specific gender, but it is we still have that messaging to unpack. So hopefully that made sense. So let's deep dive into this a little bit. So um, we're going to see some drawings of body parts. That'll be fun. All right. So why does this matter? Um, first, it matters because it means that your genitals are normal. So one of the things that happens is um, if the only education that you get about sex, for a lot of us, it's it comes from porn or the media. Um, and so what you get is these beautifully curated, photoshopped images of what body parts should look like. And then when you realize your body parts don't look like that because they haven't been photoshopped or uh, surgically enhanced or any of those things, or um, it, it can feel make you feel weird. And so um, I just it's important for folks to know like you're, you're normal and beautiful and amazing and perfect exactly the way you are. And your body parts are made up of all the same parts of everybody else. It's just that the configuration of your body parts are unique to you. And that's true for all of human sexual expression. So genital response, fantasy, sexual physiology, psychology, desire, it's all the same parts it's just organized differently for each of us. So you're normal. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, and when I say normal, I just mean like statistically. I mean, like there's, there's nothing wrong with you. All right. So let's talk about the vulva. Again, this, um, these drawings are, this is not like, oh, a perfect vulva looks like this. It's like, this is the best drawing to illustrate all the parts. Um, actually, I'm going to, I have this really cool um, vulva puppet that I am going to show you guys. So um, if, if for some reason it's not in the screen, I trust that someone will unmute their mic and yell at me and tell me to move it because um, <laughs> I can't see. Um, but this is, this is my vulva puppet named Mulva. Um, and if we have time at the end during Q&A, uh, you guys can ask me about why her name is Mulva. And if somebody knows, that would be really cool. If you know why her name is Mulva, if that reference means something to you, um, I'll send you a, a treat in the mail. Um, so this is Mulva. Uh, and what we're looking at here is, uh, this is the clitoral hood. And then underneath the clitoral hood, you have just the exposed part of the clitoris. So we'll talk a little bit more about the clitoris um, in the next slide. And then this is your uh, 
the out, the, sometimes we call them the lips, but this is the labia majora. I'm sorry, uh, labia majora, labia minora. So labia majora are here on the outside. Labia minora are here, so inner lips. And for some folks, like, they stick out, like, on this puppet. And for other folks, they're, like, tucked in. And um, for some folks, it's like you got one out and one tucked in. And, and so there's not like a, a right or wrong way for this to look. But sometimes there can be really weird messaging about how uh, vulvas look. Like they're all beautiful. They're all awesome. And then um, this is all of this, including the clitoris, that's all called the vulva. And then the stuff inside is the vagina. So this is not a vagina. This is a vulva. The vagina is you got the vaginal opening and then all the stuff inside the inside there. That's the vagina. So... All right, let's move forward. All right, so this is the clitoris. I um, love talking about the clitoris because some there's always at least one person who's never seen this drawing. This is what the whole clitoris looks like. It's a little bit like an iceberg. Um, this is um, my my clitoris model is named Dolores. It's the same reference as Mulva, my Volvo puppet. Um, and basically what you've got is you've got these, um, it's the whole structure is actually an external structure. Uh, it sits just behind the, um, like it's, it's not exposed, but it's in front of the vaginal opening. And so, um, it, it's not in, it's not like you have part of it internal and part of it external. It's actually all external. It's just got skin, uh, vaginal, uh, Volvo skin covering it. Um, and you've got your crura here and it's like clitoral legs here and then these bulbs uh when you're aroused they fill up with blood and they get really puffy and there's lots of um really fun uh sensation there and so uh when we talk about like the quote-unquote like g-spot um stimulation what we're really doing is stimulating the clitoris from the inside um there's not actually an anatomical spot in your body called a g-spot but a lot of folks understand what that spot is or have heard of it or read a Cosmo article about it. Um, but it's actually just what you're stimulating and is, um, it, you're stimulating the, if, if you kind of reach in, I, I've got the, the puppet back up. Um, but you kind of do like a come here motion and then you get the, the clitoris internally and you also get the urethral sponge. So if this is your urethra, then the urethral sponge is back here. And so all of that has a lot of nerve endings. And that can be very pleasurable and orgasmic for folks who have those body parts to stimulate it that way. And so for a really long time, we called that the G-spot. But now our educators and doctors are sort of moving away from that because calling it the G-spot suggests that there was some sort of magic orgasm button that people with clitoris has had. And not everybody has is stimulated that way or is aroused that way, which is a good foundation for our talk. Not everybody's bodies work the same way. And so folks who didn't have this magic spongy arousal button and weren't instantly orgasmic from G spot stimulation were feeling like there was something wrong with them. So if that is, if that does work for you and that does feel really good, freaking awesome. If it doesn't work for you and that doesn't feel good to you and that is not orgasmic to you also totally fine, totally normal. And so, um, we're kind of busting up that very pervasive myth that there's like a magic orgasm button and you just have to find it. Like, I don't, I don't know that that is really a thing that exists for anybody. Um, I think that a lot of things are at play. So we'll keep talking about that. All right. So now we're talking about the penis. This is also super fun. Um, again, I have a visual aid. This is my, um, oh, it has a feather on it. I don't I even know how that happened. This is my, uh, penis model. I use a rainbow one because, one, it's fun, right? Like, it's so much fun. Um, and I sometimes when I do outreach, it sits on a table and we do condom demos with it. And people are so much more likely to approach you when you have a rainbow dildo in your hand. They're like, what is that? Um, <laughs> but uh, this is um, also because I didn't want to spend the money to buy all the different skin tones. So I just picked rainbow. Um, so what we're looking at is the glands of the penis is here. And then you've got the wraith down the middle. And most of the nerve endings in the penis are going to be like up where the glands is and then down the wraith. And, uh, there are in the, in the exposed part of the clitoris, that little knob that we showed out of the clitoral hood, there are 8,000 nerve endings in that one little spot. It's about the size of your nail, your fingernail on your pinky finger, um, maybe a little smaller. And then the, uh, the, the penis has 4,000 nerve endings. So half as many. Um, and that's why folks with a penis sometimes, prefer like a stronger touch than folks with the clitoris. It's again, not a formula. 
talk to your partners. But um, that's sort of why there's that difference in sensation. There are fewer nerve endings. Okay, let's move forward a little bit. Um, so this, this diagram is really cool because we talked about, you know, it's all the same parts. This shows like developmentally how these parts relate to each other and how like, so if you're in a body that has an elongated clitoris or if you're in a body that has, um, a penis that's like maybe smaller than, um, what you see on TV or in porn or whatever, there's nothing wrong with that. It's all just about like how your body developed as those things were happening and, all of it can be pleasurable and all of it can be amazing. And there's a list of pros and cons to every single shape of everybody's body. I've never met a single person who didn't have something they wanted to change. And so um, it's, it's really about just understanding how your body works and understanding that, hey, you're totally normal. And uh, then finding the ways to find pleasure with the body shape you have. All right. And then this is just very briefly um, the when we talk about like uh, ejaculatory fluid, um, the prostate is a big part of that process in bodies with a penis. And then there is the Skeen's gland and the Bartolin's glands in bodies with a vagina. And I just wanted to show this so that I could move on to the next slide, which um, is just like building these parts together. So we talk about how these things are sort of, again, depending on how development happens, your body is either going to end up with a penis or a vulva. The clitoral hood is homo homologous to the foreskin. The testes are homologous to the ovaries. The skein's gland and the prostate are homologous to each other. Um, so the skein's gland does secrete a fluid that is a component of ejaculation. So folks in a body with a vulva who ejaculate, it's not urine. There is like an ejaculatory fluid. Um, again, that's not the talk we're doing, but maybe next time. Um, and then the frenulum is homologous to the foreshet and you can see the drawing there. We didn't really talk about it when I had my models up, but you can just see that these break down. And later, if somebody's like, send me your slides, I'll be happy to send you a PDF if you want to see this later. Okay. So now we get to the fun part. Um, and I'm still doing great on time. Okay. So, so true or false, sex is a drive. So just decide right now, what do you think true or false? If there's a chat going, you can put your vote in the chat. Um, but true or false, sex is a drive. There are people who have really strong feelings about this. Just taking a minute to drink my coffee. Um, so we're going we're gonna to discuss this and then we'll come back to this. And we'll see who was right, the true or the false folks. All right. So we're going to talk about desire versus arousal. So the mental processes that create desire versus the physiological process that is sexual arousal. And those are distinct processes that um, communicate with each other, but um, they are not the same thing. So we're going to make that distinction. All right. So desire, we sometimes call it libido. Um, a lot of folks that end up in my office or end up in a sex therapist's office or end up trying to pull a magazine off the shelf looking for advice, they're doing so because of some – it's frequent that people are looking for an answer to questions about their libido. So they're in a situation where their partner has a different libido level than they do. A partner wants more sex or less sex. Um, and a lot of the issues here are um, – you know, they're not, they're having frustration with communication. They're having frustration with how often they're having sex and, um, mismatched libido can be really, really frustrating for folks, especially if they don't know how to talk about it and they don't know what to do with it. And then, um, there's this statement here that says poor libido can impact, um, your sexual response cycle. And I, I put that there, but I actually don't love that language of poor libido. It's often that people are self-describing their libido as poor libido because we tend to celebrate, a very um, active libido. So, you know, when we talk about sex in the media and when you see sex in porn, people are usually just like always ready to go all the time. And if they're not, there's like something wrong with them or, or you know, and, and that's just like not the case. And so when I say poor libido, that tends to be because somebody has identified that they're not happy with their libido experience. And if they're feeling frustration around the way they experience libido and they're feeling frustrated, like it's either too much or not enough based on their personal assessment, that can impact 
how their body becomes aroused. So then arousal is your sexual response cycle. So that's your physiological response. And it's closely linked to your libido, but it's not the same thing. And so people who have low libido, low desire, can still totally experience sexual arousal, even to the point of orgasm. And people with high desire, high libido, can still struggle to experience or maintain all the different levels of their sexual response cycle. So um, the conversation we're really going to have is like what triggers arousal. So this is called Basson's model of sexual motivation. So we used to see the like Masters and Johnson like four phase model. And for a long time, that four phase model of sexual response um, was kind of the, that was the standard by which um, we discussed sexual response and orgasm. And there's, that was awesome. Like what Masters and Johnson did for us was so amazing. And they gave us so much language to talk about sexuality and orgasm. But what that left out was that was very much focused on the, the physiological mechanisms at play. What it left out was the neurological component, the psychological component, the, um, context, right? So context is like everything. So Basson's model says, well, yes, physiological response is important, but we need to understand what goes into that. And so this is sort of a loop and you've got two different types of desire. So on the, on, I guess it's my left, it might be your right, the, the pink, the pink loop. Um, this is more responsive, what well, responsive desire. And I'm going to break this down in a different way. So just bear with me, but the, the pink loop is like responsive desire. So what you've got is like a, first a willingness to, be receptive to sexual behavior. So a willingness to engage in sexual behavior is like the start. So if you don't have consent, like this all sort of falls apart a little bit. Um, if the person just does not want sex at all, and that's something different. You can want sex very much and your body not respond. And we'll again talk about that. But like the first stage is just this willingness. Then the next stage is a sexual stimulus of some kind with appropriate context. And again, we're going to break this down. That process is completely impacted by a person's arousability. So again, I can want sex a lot, but if there's something physiologically impacting my ability to become aroused, it doesn't matter how much I want it, my body's not responding. Um, if arousability exists, then arousal will happen. You get arousal and responsive desire. So responsive desire is somebody who's responding to those sexual cues. So we talked about sexual stimuli with context, 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 context. That context is good. I respond to that context. Arousal occurs. Then I have because I, I've got that lineup, I've got the arousal, I've got the, res the physiological response, and I wanted the sex, that creates emotional and physical satisfaction, which is motivating. I had a positive sexual experience. I was emotionally satisfied. I was physically satisfied. That is sexual motivation to continue. And then the cycle keeps going. And you can kind of, your brain and body can sort of drop in and out in any phase of that cycle, but that's just sort of how it all connects. Um, spontaneous desire, that's the like purple and teal on the other side of the screen. That, um, that is something different. That is like, you're walking down the street, you see, no, that's not it. That is, that was going to be a bad, a, a bad example. That's like you wake up in the morning and you're horny or you're, you just notice like, oh man, I really want sex right now. Or arousability is very easy and ready for you. And you're constantly you're very consistently and frequently in the mood. So it lines up very quickly without a lot of to do. And so again, we're going to break that down. So that's sort of our foundation for that concept. Let's talk about it a little bit more in depth. Okay. So it's a nonlinear model. So we talked about it can kind of, you can kind of drop in and out of it at any time. Let's talk about what works here. So we're understanding the motivations for sex. There's approach and avoidance motivation. So approach motivation is focusing on something positive. My motivation for sex might be like a, a positive approach motivation might be like, I want to um, connect with my partner. So that's an approach motivation. Or I really want to feel the good sensation of having somebody touch my body. Or I'm really excited about the role play. Or I got this new toy I want to try. Like those are a, a positive reason for engaging. Avoidance motivation is characterized by a desire to prevent or stop something. So um, I can't sleep and I'm having this insomnia and I want to stop my insomnia. So let me just knock one out and pass out. Or my partner is asking me over and over and over again for sex. And I really need to get back to this other thing. I was folding laundry and I really need to get back to that. So let me just have sex with my partner so they can like do the thing and, and then I'll go back to it. Um, so 
a desire to prevent or stop something, that's an avoidance motivation. Um, approach motivations have a more positive impact on this cycle for reasons we can probably all guess. So being mindful of sexual stimuli. So what people find sexually stimulating may differ really widely. So there's um, erotic, you know, things that are like blatantly sexual, um, erotica, porn, that kind of thing. But again, even in that space, there's a wide variety of options because porn I like to watch and porn you like to watch might be wildly different. Um, but then also other things some people don't find that stimulating at all, but some folks are stimulated by coming home and seeing that their partner cleaned the house for them. Or um, they're stimulated by somebody surprising them with a gift. Um, or they're stimulated by watching somebody be really good at their skill. You know, some people really like watching somebody be very talented and smart. Um, so there's lots of things that are brain registers as sexual stimuli that can be really widely different. And so understanding that there's that wide variety can really help when you're trying to put yourself in this framework, that there's not like one script for what this looks like. Um, sexual stimuli will initiate arousal when all other conditions are met. So again, that whole cycle is important. And um, we'll, we'll talk more about this. Context, 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 context. We talk about other conditions being met. That's physical and mental context. So you've got the context of your sexual encounter and you have your state of mind at the time. If it's a really hot porn and I haven't had sex in a while, but I'm freaking exhausted and all I need to do is sleep because I have to get up for work in the morning. It might be more important to me that I need to sleep and I have to get up for work in the morning than it is for me to have sex, even if it's an otherwise very sexy environment. So in that situation, the context might be that I go to sleep, um, that kind of thing. So this is the most important condition in the sexual response cycle. Ability to experience sexual arousal. So we talked about that before, like physiologically, is there anything inhibiting your ability to experience arousal? And uh, the SRC, the sexual response cycle, can be ignited at any phase of that model. Um, and we talked about this before, a rewarding sexual experience will lead you to seek out more sex. On the flip side, a negative experience will decrease interest, whether that's in a situation or cross-situationally. So a big trauma might create a cross-situational like decrease in your desire for sex situationally, it might be that you are dating and you meet somebody who that person just doesn't do it for you. Maybe they, um, their hygiene is not great, or maybe they do something weird in bed or, you know, call you by their mom's name or something, you know, some, something that's not, um, some of you are like, don't kink shame me. Like <laughs> I'm just trying to give some examples of, um, a negative experience, you might say, okay, like, I don't want to have sex in this context with this person, or maybe it's a space in your house. Like, oh my God, I don't want to do it in the kitchen. That's weird to me or whatever, but that doesn't mean you don't want it across everything. So you've got situational decreases and cross situational decrease. And so, um, again, remembering that it's all varied. There's a lot of things at play, context, context, context. Okay. So how does this work in your brain? There's not like a single part of your brain. Sorry, I'm still checking my time. Ooh, there's not like a single part of your brain that is responsible for sex. It's all working together. It's all responsible for your sexuality. Basically what your brain is doing is it's constantly scanning your environment all the time for sexually relevant cues. In the case where the sexually relevant cues outweigh, so you've got, I'm going to back that up. Sorry. So your excitation system, your SES, that's all of the sexually relevant cues kind of go into that bucket. Your SIS is your inhibition system. Your, your, those are the not cues. So your hot cues are your excitation system and your not cues are the inhibition system. Emily Nagoski calls them your gas pedal and your brake pedal. But the original researchers used um, hot cues and not cues. And I, I like both, but we'll do, we'll go with the OG. So, so if you have more hot cues in your environment than not cues, then that tipping point tips toward excitation. If you have more not cues in your environment, then that tipping point to, uh, tips toward inhibition, no arousal, right? So once the tipping point hits a certain spot, that's what's going to kickstart the physiological process. And your brain is going to say, oh, hey, it's go time and send uh, the messages to the parts of your body that are relevant. So blood will rush to your genitals and your eyes will dilate and you'll get flushed and 
nerve endings will start to come alive. And, and so the body will physiologically respond to that neurological cue um, of like, hey, it's go time. And again, remember, everybody's cues are different. So you're in a room full of hot people. Maybe that's a hot cue. Oh, that room is a job interview and you're about to sit in front of a panel of these hot people and be evaluated for a job. Maybe that's a not cue. Maybe this isn't the time. So your brain's constantly evaluating those things. I'm going to go through the next few slides sort of quickly because I just realized um, we have time, but not like a ton. Okay. So spontaneous versus responsive desire. I said we get back to this and we're going to take a drink of my coffee real quick. I'm going to load this all up. So spontaneous desire. Spontaneous desire is sexual desire that feels like it appears spontaneously out of the blue. It's totally normal, totally healthy. We already talked about it. This is the culturally sanctioned, like expected thing. This is what we see in the media most often. This is what we see in commercials, TV, in music. Spontaneous desire is the way sexual desire is described most frequently. This may include a more frequent desire for sex. So people who want sex multiple times per week who are just... Um, or even multiple times per day, that constant sort of your brain, it's very easy for your brain to get there. Some folks may feel like that is too much, if the, especially if the context is negative. So if you're with a partner you're not attracted to, or if you're single and don't have anywhere for that desire to go, or um, if you've experienced trauma, but your desire, your, um, desire is still a spontaneous uh, thing, then it's, it, it can be, so if the, again, if the context is not positive, that can feel like too much. On the flip side, we have responsive desire. So this is sexual desire that emerges in an erotic context. And we already talked about erotic context can be different for everybody. Also, totally normal and healthy. We tend to medicalize this as low desire. Um, and there's a note that says perhaps because it's less frequent in men. So cisgender men tend to... Um, experience spontaneous desire more often. Cisgender women tend to experience responsive desire more often. And a lot of that is like, there's like hormonal and physiological reasons for that. Um, and so the cultural messages uh, tend to, the preference tends to dominate toward the, the cis male experience. And so there's a lot of um, like gender theory that we medicalize responsive desire or lower desire. Um, we like feminize it. And then it gets like a bad rap or some stigma. So that's like a thing to unpack when you're drinking later with your friends and you can be like, that person was crazy. Or you can be like, I totally agree with that. Um, may include more context sensitive desire. So somebody who just needs things to be just right. That person's not being picky. They're not being nitpicky. There's nothing wrong with having a preference for how the context goes. It's about understanding that that's like a part of your um, desire. And then it can feel like no desire in a context that has a lot of not cues. So if you have just like so much weight on the side of the scale that is your inhibition system, it doesn't matter how many erotic cues there are, like you're, that cycle's not gonna happen and that can feel really frustrating to folks. It can feel like I don't have any desire at all when really the issue is we need to deal with the amount of cues in your environment that are telling you this isn't the right time. All right, so we're back to this. True or false is sex a drive. Uh, hopefully folks are engaging. I hope I didn't put you to sleep yet. Sex is not a drive. So there are going to be psychologists who disagree with that. There are kind of two camps of people. Some people say it is. Some people say it isn't. I'm going to say it isn't. I'm in the camp of scientists and researchers and academics who say it is not a drive. And I'm going to tell you why and why that's important. So what is a drive? A drive is a bio biological mechanism whose job it is to keep the organism at a healthy baseline. So drive is like a thermostat. So drive is about survival instinct. It's pushed by an unpleasant internal state, which ends when you return to baseline. Sex is an incentive motivation system. So incentive is about thriving. So um, it is pulled by an attractive external stimulus, the incentive, and it ends when you've obtained the incentive. So sex is not sex and sexual behavior and orgasm and sexual pleasure. They don't fit the drive model. You don't need them. The species needs us to have sex to survive, but in an individual level, you do not need sex. Sex is not a survival mechanism, um, from like an internal perspective. So it's about wants and needs. Sex need is a drive. Want is something else. So why does it matter that sex is not a drive? Um, when we conceptualize sex like hunger, 
if you never get hungry, you feel like there's something wrong with you. If you think there's something wrong with you, your stress response kicks in. If your stress response kicks in, your interest in sex totally evaporates. If sex is a drive like hunger, then potential partners become like food. When we conceptualize sex like a need, it creates an environment that um, fosters a lot of sexual entitlement. Um, so it reinforces this assumption that specifically cis boys require some outlet to receive frustration where, you know, that boys will be boys concept. Um, and again, this is sort of some gender theory stuff, but men's sexual entitlement is a primary reason that when we talk about assault between cis men and cis women, one of the primary components, when we look at this research on why does this happen? Why is sexual violence happening? It's a sense of sexual entitlement. So when we teach people that sex is a drive, it's this thing you have to have. And if you don't have it, you need to go get it. We're creating, um, a bad context for sex. So deb debunking that, or I'm sorry, like breaking down that myth and saying, okay, like this is not actually a thing gives people a little bit more control over their sexual impulses. So what kinds of things impact libido and arousal? It's going to feel like drinking from a fire hose for a second. Um, what I really want you to understand is that it's a lot of things. <laughs> um, so hormones, aging, medication, chronic medical condition, trauma, abuse, all again, your brain is always scanning for these cues, but your brain is also processing all this other information. And because sex is not a component of your survival, your brain is going to prioritize the things that are a component of your survival. And anything that interferes with the way your brain talks to your body is also going to interfere with the way your brain talks to your body about sex. Like you can't disconnect your sexuality from the rest of who you are and the rest of your experience. It's all a part of who you are. And so all of these things impact libido and they all impact arousal. And I would say the biggest thing that most people experience across the board is stress. And so it won't matter how many hot cues are in your environment. If you are experiencing a lot of chronic stress that is unresolved and you're not doing what you need to do to complete your stress cycle, which I think might be a, time, a talk for another day, but um, completing your stress cycle is a big way to create space for your sexual arousal to start getting priority um, seating in your brain's system, if that makes sense. So, okay, arousal non-concordance is when, so sometimes our brains and our bodies don't match. So um, that's called arousal non-concordance. And this graph, I want to apologize, a lot of this research is done on cis men and cis women. So really what we're talking about is Folks in bodies with a penis that have a lot of testosterone and a lot of the um, components we typically associate with that experience versus folks in a body with a vulva and a vagina. Oh, look, I've got my five-minute window. Um, folks with a vulva and a vagina and the a lot of estrogen and sort of the um, experience that that goes with. And so, um, like folks like me who are non-binary folks who are trans, you can, you'll be able to see yourself in this if we can take away the label of like men and women, but we had to have some kind of language to talk about like, and so we, we use the language from the research. Um, so for, for folks, for bodies with a penis that have, that are not undergoing any kind of hormone, um, treatment, uh, there's a 50% overlap between what a cis man's genitals respond to as sexually relevant and what his brain responds to as sexually appealing. So that match, my brain says this is good and my body agrees and let's go. There's like a 50% overlap. So 50% of the time that matches. Now about 50% of the time that doesn't match. So that's when you get things like accidental boners and that's when you get things like you really want it, but you can't get it up or you can't keep it up like that experience. And again, lots of things impact that, but about 50% of the time, those things line up. When it doesn't, that's called arousal non-concordance. For cis women, um, it's only a 10% overlap. So women's genitals are relatively general in what they respond to, but their brains are more sensitive to context. Again, this is not everybody. We're talking about like statistical generalities. And um, what we're really talking about is like, again, a lot of this has to do with like hormones and physiology. And then there are also social cues about what is and is not appropriate for sexual behavior for folks who occupy different gender spaces and different body types. And those messages also creep in and they inform. So there's a lot of reasons that this occurs. But what we're talking about is that your body and your brain don't always cooperate with each other. And that is called arousal non-concordance. So a stimulus can be sexually relevant 
without being sexually appealing. So that's when we hear arguments like, well, it wasn't rape because you had an orgasm. Well, no, I had an orgasm because my body physiologically responded to a sexually relevant situation, but I did not, my mentally, I did not find that sexually appealing. I did not, that does not mean I wanted that, if that makes sense. All right. Oh, good. Okay. So I've got just a couple more minutes because it looks like we're close to time. Um, improving libido and arousal. So arousal is a lot easier to treat than libido. Libido is more an issue of like unpacking the not cues in your life, unpacking all of the things in your life that are contributing. So that might be a conversation for a doctor or a sex coach or an educator, someone like me, someone like a sex therapist. If you're having issues and you think they're libido issues, um, concerns, questions, whatever, unpacking that is longer. Arousal is about finding where the buttons are and pushing them. And that comes through with like foreplay and, um, you know, again, discovering what turns you on, finding, um, context that you find sexual. And that's a big part of the negotiation process. So like our last slide moving forward, what can you do? So first you want to determine where your blocks are. Everybody has them, whether you're super happy with your, your libido or you're like, you know, I, I wish the situation was different more or less or whatever. Um, determining where your blocks are and there's kind of stages. What can you work through quickly? So I know that I can't have sex in a room where the bed's not made because the mess or where there's a big pile of laundry because the mess really stresses me out. So move the laundry or fold the laundry before we have sex. All of a sudden that frees up. I worked through that quickly. What will be more time consuming to work through? Well, I'm on medicine that's impacting this. So I need to talk to my doctor about adjusting my meds. Will I need help working through any of this? And then again, am I enlisting a professional? Yes, no, maybe lists. So we're reconceptualizing what counts as sex. And that's taking an inventory of sexually relevant or sexually appealing cues, whether that's behaviors, whether that's things you find erotic. It's understanding the contexts and it's making a list. Yes, are all the things that you're like, this is a go for me. You kiss me on my neck and I'm in, or you do the dishes for me, go time, whatever, right? You write your yes list. Your maybe is stuff that's like, well, if it's really hot for you, I could be talked into it, or it's not always hot for me, but sometimes, or I haven't tried it yet, but it might be hot. So those are your maybes and your no's are like, please don't do this, or this is a turnoff, or these are not cues. So creating those lists with you, with your partner and kind of reconceptualizing like what is sex to me? That's a really good way to like process through that. Shifting the focus away from orgasm. So orgasm is not the goal. If orgasm happens, awesome, but it's about your whole sexual experience. And understanding that sometimes your sexual experience will include orgasm. And if that's important to you, hurrah, congrats. And sometimes your sexual experience will not include orgasm, but it can still be really wonderful and rewarding. Sometimes you can have an orgasm and it's really disappointing. <laughs> and so if orgasm is the whole goal and you're very focused on that, that stress of performance pressure can really impact the rest of your sexual experience and get in your way. So shifting the focus away from that. And then finally experimenting with the cues that are sexually irrelevant. So toys, lubricant is a huge part of that. Again, maybe we can get to that in the Q and a games, erotica, but like what else, like what else is sexually relevant to you? What is exciting to you? So that's, that's it. That's the whole talk. Um, and, uh, there's my contact info and I only went like a few minutes over. So, um, yeah, I, uh, if we have any questions, we'll do that during the Q&A. But um, yeah, that's, that's, that's it for me. So uh, I don't know where the team is. If you guys want to head back. Hello. Well, brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Angel. Um, we, we are now going to take a short break, um, which will last uh, about 15 minutes. We're coming back at about five past eight. Um, so you've got time to recharge your glasses, go to the loo, whatever you need to do, maybe bang one out. Um, and please keep using uh, the break time to keep submitting your, uh, your questions, upvoting other questions that you'd like to see asked. Um, don't forget to find us on Facebook and Twitter and check our website for details of up and coming talks. We've got loads planned uh, that we're really excited to bring to you. Um, but once again, thank you, Angel, and we're going to go to a quick break. Okay, well, welcome back. Hope you've all got uh, full glasses and you're ready for our Q&A. Um, 
So I'm just going to dive right into it and start by asking the questions in order that have got most of them. And I will do my best to try to answer them. <laughs> okay, so our, our first question is from Anonymous. Um, Anonymous. How do you solve the frustration of mismatched libidos in a monogamous relationship? Oh, yeah, isn't that like the age old question, right? Um, I think I, and, it, and it's, it, there's not a short answer. So I'll do my best to try to give you something that you can take away from here. That's real. I think the first thing is understanding, like ha maybe having a conversation about what you just learned about how you are turned on. So if you're realizing there's a mismatch, then before we start like jackhammering away at solutions, we want to understand like, what is the mechanism we're trying to fix? Right. And so if one is it more important to one of you than the other, right? Like, is one of you, like, what is the reason for the mismatch? Is it just like the other one can't be bothered, doesn't think about it, but if it comes up, great. Or is it like one of you is dealing with trauma, right? Like, is it that one of you, like, can't control how much you want it? Or is it that one of you is just like, no, I'm always ready to go, so let's go. Like, really understanding that first. So, again, without knowing that, it's very hard to say, like, do this understanding that and then saying, okay, if these are libido issues, then let's walk through ways to try to see how we can get on the same page. If they're arousal issues, we have the conversations about how to deal with arousal. At the end of the day, the partner who's wanting a lot of sex, this is the person who needs to reconceptualize what sex means to them the most. Because there can be a lot of context that feels safe and rewarding to the partner with the lower libido that everybody will be satisfied with. So think about like erotic massage. Think about getting out toys to play more. Um, you might have a partner who says, I'm not just feeling it, but I'm happy to hang out with you and watch a porn and play with toys with you and engage in your masturbation. And then it still feels like you're coming together. So if you're the partner with like the super high libido, then saying, okay, like what is it that I really want out of this exchange? What is important to me about this? Is this something I can get on my own with a handful of toys? Or is this something I want my partner to be engaged in? And then saying, okay, like, how can we compromise? So it can be frustrating. There is a lot of conversation. But if we can kind of move away from what feels like a rewarding sexual experience and include more things in that bucket, you'll find that all of a sudden you have like a lot more positives to hold on to. So uh, hopefully that was kind of an answer I, it's such a big problem. It's such a big thing for folks. But it's a difficult problem to know how to deal with because I imagine in that situation, both partners feels like a dick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You feel, and you feel bad and then you don't want to make your partner feel bad for who they are and you don't want to, and then, and I, again, I don't know the situation, but sometimes if you don't have great coping skills, you start to use it as a weapon against each other or there's a lot of resentment that builds up. But if I can say like, think of it like your sexual love language. Okay. And so if you don't know what the love languages are, Google five love languages There's a quiz. You can take it, but I'm going to assume we all know just because we don't have a ton of time. If one of you, your love language is physical touch and the other one is words of affirmation. The physical touch person is like, I'm not getting enough touch. You don't love me. And the words of affirmation person is saying, I tell you, I love you every day. Like, what are you talking about? And vice versa. You want to hug me all the time, but you never tell me you love me. What am I just sex to you? No, I'm hugging you because I love you. Like, and so it's, finding like how are you both communicating sexually and what are your sexual needs and can you find the space in that Venn diagram where they overlap and so yeah it, it is challenging it is definitely the other thing when we talk about monogamy having conversations about what does that include are you the type of monogamous that says I, my partner can't watch porn because I have to be their entire sexual outlet well if you're really sexually mismatched that might not be realistic for you anymore does it mean some people feel really offended when their partner masturbates without them I'm not saying that's happening here but I know that happens a lot so we're creating a situation where a partner has no sexual outlet aside from us and then we're holding the keys to those sexual experiences be honest with yourself. Is that what's happening? If that's what's happening, unpack it. Is there jealousy around their sexuality not always including you? Guess what? That's super totally normal. And there are ways for that to fit into your monogamy in ways that don't threaten you. And you can be part of that solution and feel really empowered. So yeah, it's a lot to unpack without knowing all the specifics. It's hard to say like, do this thing. But hopefully I at least gave you like a space to talk from. <laughs> um, our next question is from Andrew. Uh, Hi, Andrew. I asked, 
uh, given lots of people experience sexual desire, arousal, enjoy sex, and we are open about so many things nowadays, why do we still find it so hard to talk about this? Um, I think it's the middle sentence, the we are so open. Um, if you are in circles where people are really open about their sexuality, it can, and I experience this a lot because I'm around sex educators and I'm in a lot of very sex positive spaces. I sometimes forget that that's kind of a bubble and that most folks do not exist in that space. And so the space that the majority of people are occupying is a space that says, this is not something we talk about in polite company. This is not something we talk about at the dinner table. This is not something we talk about at all. And we use euphemisms. Like when you're growing up, your, your parents use euphemisms for your body parts and euphemisms for sex. And we hide the conversation from our kids and then our kids pass the age where we should have been having the conversation and then nobody's had it. And then now they're asking their friends and their friends don't have good language either. And so it's, you've got to unpack an entire system of putting this in the shadows. And so if you are existing in a bubble where folks are being really light about it, it can seem like, well, that's so easy. Why isn't everybody doing it? But then remember that most people have been taught when you teach somebody, you don't say this in front of other people. The subtext of that is you should be ashamed of this. The subtext of that is embarrassment. The subtext of that is there's something wrong with this conversation or that you should just know the answers to these questions. Like there's this idea that sex ed is common sense, which it is not. And and so, yeah, I don't, why is it still like that? Because we're still, most of our social messages are still really puritanical. They just are. Most of our social messages are still really prioritize, you know, straight white folks getting married, having 2.5 kids. Like there's a message that sex and relationships should look a certain way. And anything that's sort of outside of that, even if you look like that on the surface, anything that's outside of that, you start to feel like nobody's talking about this. There must be something wrong with me. So, so yeah, so you have folks like me who are like, I'll take the bullet. I'll just say it. <laughs> okay. okay. So our next question comes from Gray and they ask, is asexuality low desire, a desire for low desire or something else entirely? I'm going to say it's something else entirely. So, um, sometimes we, you'll hear people conflate the terms or you'll hear people say things like situational asexuality. And I don't think that that's the most correct way to talk about it. I think it's just using relatable terms to try to help people understand a concept, but asexuality as I understand it. So I'm going to, I'm also going to preface, like we all use language in really different ways. And so the the resources I have had to learn this language and experience these concepts might be different than how folks who are hearing me have like learned this stuff because some of this can change. Ge There's not, when you come out, there isn't like actually a gay agenda where you like get a book of terms and everybody's on the same page. <laughs> this stuff changes geographically. It can change, you know, based on your, like there's so many things that can change how we talk about language. So how I use this language, how I understand it, how I teach it and what I know the best information I have is that asexuality is a pervasive part of your identity. It is a pervasive general disinterest. So it's sort of, I don't hate sex. I don't care about sex. It's not there. Now, maybe I'll be in a relationship with a partner who likes it very much. Turns out my body will still respond to these cues. I'm willing to negotiate a sexual relationship of some kind. That's totally fine with me. Or I totally have no interest in it all. I'm going to go ahead and seek out partners who don't ask for that from me, whatever. Like how I manifest that physiologically, I get to make those choices. Asexual people still, a lot of them still have very healthy sex lives. They're just generally sort of like neither here nor there about sex. That's, that can look like low desire. But when we're talking about these mechanisms of desire, we're sort of talking about a spectrum where asexuality sort of exists adjacent to it. It's a very different type of experience and it's a pervasive part of that person's identity that they are completely okay with. And it's, you don't have to be okay with your identity for it to be your identity. But generally speaking, like you've said, like this is who I am as a person. This is not changing. This isn't some mechanism that needs to be tweaked. I don't need to de-stress my life and then things will shift. This is this is just who I am. So I, I don't think it's the same as low desire, but the mechanisms neurologically might look like that. So hopefully, hopefully that was an answer and not just more questions. <laughs> I'm going to abuse my position. This isn't a question from, um, from Slido, 
But like, do you know like, if there's been any research into like the neurological mechanisms that differentiate people um, who are like who identify as asexual and people who don't, or like, is because I imagine that would be a, like a slightly really scale to a large extent. Done. Fun, interest. Yeah, so I, I've always seen asexuality presented as a spectrum. So we talk about like the gray spectrum. So we do understand um, what research has been done. And a lot of that is qualitative. So we're talking to people about their experiences. We do understand that people experience asexuality in a variety of ways. And that's why I say it's sort of an adjacent spectrum to the kinds of conversations we're having. So you've got folks who... Um, like let's say a person who's demisexual. So a person who's demisexual will experience desire for sex based on very specific contexts. And so that looks a lot like context specific responsive desire. But somebody who has context specific responsive desire isn't necessarily demisexual. Does does that sort of like it's not the same and in terms of like what the research is, I'm I'll be honest, I'm not super duper familiar with all the research. I don't know if that's because it's not there or if I just haven't like come across it. Um, it is, I will say it is very hard to get funding for research on stuff like this. Anytime you're talking about the more narrow the subset of the population you get, the harder it is to do the research and get the research funded. And so that doesn't mean it's not there. I just have not come across a ton of it yet. So, but I can dig in and see what I can find. Okay, great. Um, we have another anonymous question. All right. And the question is, I'm on the asexual spectrum, I experience, I experience arousal, but the only actual sex I desire or enjoy is masturbation on my own. Where does this fit into what you described? Uh, it, it, actually, the way you described it is where it fits in. It fits into that we talk about arousal non-concordance. So your body will respond to sexual cues. And, and you can create the context that is appealing for that to occur. But other cues, whether or not other people find them sexually relevant, they don't create that same sense of desire for you. They're not kickstarting it. So in this case, um, the, any desire mechanism is kickstarted by the physiological. So um, knowing that like masturbation will feel good, this person may or may not decide, you know what, I know this is going to feel good, so I'm going to go. It's like... It's going to be a terrible analogy, but hang there. Like, it's sort of like, I want to go to the gym, but I don't want to go to the gym. But then once I get there and I'm working out, I feel really good. That's not me. I just know some people feel like that. Um, <laughs> so like, oh, now that I'm here, I'm really happy I did it. My body feels great. I'm so glad I did it. But like before when I was sitting on my couch, I maybe felt like I couldn't be bothered. It's almost a similar experience to that where, where some folks are like, I want to work out all the time. I can't relate to it, but they're like that. It, it's kind of like that. This is a person who, at least if I understand how they're describing themselves, the mental space of hot and not cues, they're kind of just not registering any of those cues that way. But they know if I masturbate, this will feel good. And so because I have that knowledge, I'm going to choose to engage in that behavior. And then I'll get the same flush of hormones and awesome feelings that I would get if I had had the inclination to be sexual in the first place, if that makes sense. So, so it's still in the wheel. It's just the part of the wheel where we hit arousal. Remember I talked about you can drop in at any part of that and you're still in the wheel. This person has bypassed all the mental processes and has started at the physiological. And then they have an experience that feels rewarding to them physiologically, and maybe emotionally, and they know that's there. And so then they're sexually motivated to engage in that. And they may not hit all those buttons, but they know that like that's where their cycle is. Yeah. So hopefully that helped. Okay. <laughs> um. We have another anonymous question. Um, do you think if masturbation was discussed at school, the push for people uh, to want to have sex early would stop? Probably, yeah. I mean, we see a lot of, there is research that pleasure-based sex ed does delay the um, occurrence of first, like first sexual, um, sexual debut. So um, uh, folks who get, good sex ed that includes pleasure education, wait longer to have sex. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that. I do think that if we um, gave people permission to masturbate instead of treating it like a gateway drug. And I mean, so, some folks are definitely like, they're like, oh, this feels good. I want to do it and I want other people to do it to me and I want to do it to other people. And that's like totally okay too. Like I'm not going to say it's be like that for everybody. But I mean, I think we all can agree that like, <laughs> it's 
it's that phenomenon of what sounds like a good idea right before I orgasm and what sounds like a good idea right after I orgasm are not always the same thing. And so I've had clients before who um, I tell them before you text your ex, knock one out. <laughs> and if you still feel like sending that text after that, then know that you're ready for the emotional labor that will come with it because the orgasm, like the sex piece is you've satiated that for a minute. And so it's kind of the same concept. Like if you're like, I don't know, I think I really want to like, I think I'm ready to get with my boyfriend, knock one out. And then if you're still feeling that, then maybe it's time to have that conversation. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think masturbation would be a great addition to sex education in schools. But I think that we will probably not see that in our lifetimes, unfortunately. Hopefully my kids will. <laughs> Maybe not my children. They would rather die than talk about this with me because they know what I do for a living. But kids in their generation, maybe they'll be able to help change that. <laughs> I really love the phrase, the phrase sexual debut. It makes it sound like there's a top hat involved. Right? Well, there should be a top hat involved and like glitter. I love sexual debut. Losing your virginity is such a weirdly archaic, like unnecessarily <laughs> biblical concept. There's no like medical correlation to virginity. That's not really a thing. Hymens don't, they're like, Popping your cherry is like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Hymens don't burst. Like none of that is real. We talk about medically accurate. That is one of the top examples of medically inaccurate myths that are pervasive even in the school systems. Like that's just not how any of it works. And so I like I, the first time I heard sexual debut, I was like, I fucking love that. That sounds like I'm going to get out my fancy gloves and yeah, my top hat and look at me. I'm on the scene. <laughs> so yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's very empowering. It's a choice you made. One is like this thing you had that someone took from you. And the other is like, here's this thing I am giving and it is still mine. Right. I didn't give anything away. It still exists within me. I am now making the choice to share or not share it with other people. And by the way, I do think masturbation counts as sexual debut. I think the, I think when you start discovering your sexuality in terms of sexual pleasure, because sexuality exists in our entire lives from the time we are birthed into existence we are sexual beings just like anything else. How that manifests shifts as we mature. But I think that discovering sexual pleasure, whether that's with a partner or with someone else, and discovering that your body has things that feel good about it, I think that all counts as sexual debut. So, so that was a real tangent. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yay for it's masturbation. Tangent, though. <laughs> Our next question comes from Remy, and they ask, female orgasm, not associated with ovulation. What is its evolutionary use? Some Lloyd and S. G. Gould uh, defined it at, or said it had none, like male nipples. Is that does that ring? Is there a consensus on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, everything I've seen is that they're that yeah that when you're trying to get pregnant, a body with a a body with a vagina, a body with a vulva, that orgasm can help. Uh, that process along. Um, so that, that, but, but in terms of like all by itself, I just recently, and I haven't read it yet, but I just recently saw research that spoke to this, that suggested that the clitoris might play some role, some evolutionary role. I, I literally, it was like, I saw a title and like an abstract. So I cannot like, but if somebody wants to like Google later, I think there is something like making the rounds out there, like researchers that are like, hey, we have this other theory, but it's like one piece. So all the other researchers ahead of this is that the clitoris exists solely for the purpose of pleasure, which is awesome. Now, I will say the evolutionary component to that might be that if sex is more fun, I'm more likely to have it. <laughs> and then if I'm more likely to have, if I'm a, if I'm a, heterosexual being and I'm having sex with somebody that can get me pregnant and we're just talking about evolutionary perspective. And if I'm, if I'm motive, if I'm more sexually motivated, right? Like that obviously has some evolutionary component, but no, like the clitoris is there for pleasure. That's it. So I saw it was a meme that was like, if, if cis women needed to orgasm to get pregnant, there would be like eight people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah obviously like it is my goal to to do away with that horrible myth that um that that uh cis female pleasure is not important because it, it very much is and it should be listen your partner should be enjoying their sex whether that's orgasm or not like if you're engaging in sex and the other person's not into it stop it like that's that's not a yes right like only a yes is a yes and body language will tell you so yeah we talk about pleasure like 
everybody should want to be there. <laughs> I think the, the one hypothesis that, that comes to mind, because like, I have heard that, that I've heard of relating to female orgasm, is something that's charmingly referred to as the upsuck hypothesis, which is the suggestion that when um, a woman has an orgasm, her vagina contracts and causes a <laughs> and it's yeah it's a horrible thought um <laughs> i guess <laughs> I, I don't really it's a long time since i read the paper but i think one of the ways that they tried to look into it was by seeing how much semen dripped back out after orgasm yes versus how um much but I think it's still it's still a very fringe idea. Like not everything that exists needs a functional explanation. Like a lot of things do have functional explanations, but not everything needs it. Well, it's okay if the functional explanation is pleasure. Like that is a function, right? Like that is a function. It's just not something we've been taught to prioritize. Mm. But yeah, but I, I've heard that. I didn't, I've never actually heard that term for it. So now I'm like, I'm learning. This is great. I love this. But um, yeah, I have heard that same thing. And I, the, also, the other premise of studying that is that there would have to be simultaneous orgasm. Like, you would have to have, like, ejaculation and then the orgasm to, like, instantly, like... So, like, lining that up, I imagine that research would be fun to conduct, but very time-consuming. So... <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on to the next question. Um, so, the next question is from Russ, and they ask, why does desire change with familiarity, or is that a myth? No, totally not a myth. Novelty has a lot to do with desire and that's related to hormones. So we talk about like the, the mechanisms in our brain that are responsible for all this. And again, in 45 minutes, there's just only so much we can do, but part of the physiological processes in arousal is hormone based. And when we meet a new shiny person, um, in the non-monogamous community, there's a term for this, it's called new relationship energy. And it's basically just this way of communicating all the heavy lifting our hormones do in terms of attraction to another person. So if I meet a new person and somehow I've had that spark of attraction, I get this rush of dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all the, all the yay, happy, this is great reward hormones rush in. And so every time I see this person, I feel good and I want more of that. And it's like the morphine button you get in the hospital. And I just want to keep pushing the button. And so it's very easy to look past what might be not cues because I'm so flooded with hot cues. And then the longer that I'm with that person, let's say that we settle into a relationship, it's not that I'm getting less of those hot cues. It's that my brain is acclimating to that flood of emotion so I'm, or that flood of hormones. So my partner still gives me the same dopamine rush, but my brain is acclimated to that, right? So now I'm, so it's not like it levels off. It's like my brain is like, okay, we're used to this. This is our new normal. So my brain is at a baseline. And so it doesn't give me that same like rush experience. And so that's that familiarity. So then I want to get that new rush experience novelty is how we create that. So familiarity, it's because your brain has said like, okay, now we're used to this. This is our new baseline. So something else is going to need to come in to get us over that baseline. And so that something else could be just like changing. A lot of times it's changing context is so simple. And people just don't think about like, when you first get together, you make out on the couch a lot. And then when you get to like, the sex phase, making out like takes a back seat. So anytime I have a couple that's with me, that's like, our spark is gone. I'm like, okay, for two weeks, you are only allowed, or a month or whatever, you're only allowed to make out with each other. Everything over the clothes, dry humping, making out, that's it. That's all you're allowed to do. I don't know what it is, but I always, they come back to like, we didn't make it. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, see, there it is. So you're just changing your context. So, but yeah, that, there is science that familiarity does. It, it's not that it... I don't love describing it as a decrease in libido. It's a shifting of context. So your brain is still operating in the ways it always operated. It's just that it, it's like when there's a myth that if you use a vibrator too much, that it will like numb your senses to other sexual experiences. That's actually not true, but your brain, your brain loves shortcuts. Like our brain is built on creating shortcuts. Our brain is built on making things easier for us. Brains are kind of stupid sometimes. And so like, if I spend six days of my week using a Hitachi magic wand to orgasm, and then the seventh day of my week, my partner comes in and nothing with batteries is involved. It's not that my partner can't do it. It's that the context is so wildly different than what I have trained my body to respond to that it just might take a little bit of time for my 
body to figure out, like my brain knows it's sexually relevant, but my body hasn't caught up to those cues yet. It's just a shift in context. So there's nothing, you're not going to damage your body by using battery operated toys or not using them or whatever. Just remember that every time you create sexual context, your brain remembers that and brains love shortcuts. On the flip side, if you're like, I really, really want to ignite that desire, you can train your brain to recognize something in sexual context. And so we go back to that question of that person who said, I know masturbation is really going to feel good to me, but I don't always have a lot of desire for sex. Let's do that. Let's create a scenario where every time I'm about to have sex with my partner, I light a sandalwood candle every time. Well, eventually my Pavlovian brain is going to smell sandalwood and be like, time to go. There's like a Seinfeld episode where George, if you guys watch Seinfeld, I'm aging myself, but George um, wants to combine food and sex. And so he starts like sneaking he starts with strawberries and starts to level up. And at the end, it's like a pastrami sandwich. And he's like starting to sneak food into his sexual relationship. And the girl he's with is like, whatever. So she's like very patient with him. But they're Later, they're in the cafe and he starts to get sweaty. And Jerry's like, look what you've done to yourself <laughs> because he sees the pastrami and he starts to like his brain goes, oh, sex cues. You can teach your brain this is or is not a sexual cue. Trauma is something that tells our brain this is not a sexual cue because it damages. So a lot of times healing from trauma involves reintroducing the cue that created fear or the cue that created pain in a positive, shifting the context where that cue exists and then teaching our brains like, this is safe again, right? So our brains are malleable. The connections our brains make is very changeable. And so, and you have a lot of power over those pathways, but some of it will take some patience. I feel like I went on another rabbit hole. Did I even answer the question? Did I answer the question? <laughs> I feel like you did. Okay. <laughs> I'd say, right. Yeah. Um, yeah so it was about whether like the familiarity makes you lose your interest. That, that was like, I, for a second, I even forgot what it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Um, I'm not I'm even just, I want to piggyback off that question a little bit again, abusing okay. my position. Um, like so you're it. saying that you first meet the partner, you get all the like the rush of all the brilliant brain chemicals, and then you get acclimatized to it. Like I've, I, some of my friends that do that do sex related research have um, said that that's why when you go through a breakup, like it it can feel like withdrawals it's like withdrawing from so is, is that something that you know much about and you can expand on yeah no it's completely true um it's it's a little bit like going cold turkey off a of psych med and so um if anybody's ever been on psych meds and then decided they didn't need them anymore because they were feeling better <laughs> <laughs> you know this experience <laughs> um for those of you who don't um it's like if you drink red bull every day for a month and then stop drinking red bull or whatever so your body's acclimated to this level of, um, stimulus, these amount of, um, hormones that these, uh, chemical cues, right. And you've got all this coming in and then that person, a breakup, it, it can be painful, especially if it's unexpected because all of a sudden that's just stopped. And that those, uh, neurological inputs have just stopped. Um, there's, uh, research, really cool research I read when I was doing my degree, um, my, uh, in our neuroscience class, um, our teacher was, our professor was, uh, showing us some research on Tylenol actually helping the pain of a broken heart. Yeah. And that, and there is, there is like a lot of, and I, I, I went down that rabbit hole for a really long time after I read that because I thought that was amazing, but it is this connection of like, again, your, your brain is going to try to be as efficient as possible. And so it processes a lot of cues using the same pathways. And so you've used this reward pathway for this person and now that's gone. And, and that your brain hasn't acclimated back to not having that same amount of dopamine. And it, it, it will, the other side of that coin is it will level out. Like you will acclimate, you will survive, you will be fine. It feels like you're dying right now. I promise you're not. Take some Tylenol, get some sleep, treat yourself the way you would treat a sick person right? Like you are healing. You don't feel well. That is real. That is valid. Treat yourself with care and love the way you would. Do not text your ex. That is just going to, that's like, I'm trying to come off the Red Bull, but I'm going to drink one more. Don't do it. You just start over from scratch, <laughs> but like give yourself the time. And then when you feel like people who say like, oh, I can be friends with my ex. I have a friend who's like a, a breakup expert. Actually, 
one of my exes is a breakup expert <laughs> and we teach these class. We've taught some classes on breakups before. And one of the things that we talk about and that um, he talks about with some of the other folks he teaches is people who want to be friends with an ex, knowing that that's not always instant, that because of all these chemical and neurological and physiological processes involved with how we relate to other people, that there is a healing time that might need to occur. And again, that's going to depend on the context of the breakup. Um, we also see this phenomenon that, um, and this is relating a lot to cis women and cis men, but um, we see that cis men tend to take breakups harder if they're not the ones who initiated. And that's a lot of times because cis women have gone through a lot of the breakup process before they initiate the breakup. So they've spent a lot of time, and this can happen the other way too, but the person who has spent all the time going, I think the breakup is coming. They've had the conversations with their friends. They've started seeing this person as not a part of their reward system. They've started those chemical processes. And so they seem like they're able to move on quicker, but really it's just that they've had all this like back time to do all that chemical processing and this person's just getting it right now. So that can also explain why like mismatched responses to a breakup. It's not that your partner doesn't care. It's that your partner did a lot of healing before they ever even shared with you because they wanted to be sure, you know, so. How? Um, are you happy to keep going? With yeah, I can, go for, yeah, I can go, I can do, I don't know what your guys' time frame is. I can go for like 10 more minutes. Okay, perfect. So I, I think I told you guys I'm a victim's advocate, a sexual assault victim's advocate, and I am supposed to be helping on our hotline and I have a colleague who's running it for me right now, but I eventually need to tag back in, so. Okay, great, so about 10 more minutes. Cool. Um, so we have another anonymous question. And they ask, um, if sex is not a drive, why are we unable to turn it up and down with drugs and testosterone, like such as testosterone? Why are we or why we aren't? Why, why, why are we able to turn it up and down? Oh, we can do lots of things chemically to our body that have nothing to do with our drives, right? Like our, there is not a process in our bodies that exists that doesn't have a chemical reaction associated with it. Like your brain runs everything. So that would be like saying, um, I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't even, I usually love analogies, but my brain is drawing a blank. I, it's, um, I think the reason that sex feels like a drive is because of those chemical, because of the deep impact those chemical processes make because of its deep ties to our reward pathways and how big that feels. So if you are going through a phase where you're not getting it and you want it, it can feel very necessary to you. And there's a lot of chemical processes involved to why that feels necessary. Yes, I can adjust those processes with meds. I can get arousal drugs. I can't get all those things, but that doesn't make it necessary to my survival. So when we talk about the mechanisms that guide the way our brain prioritizes things. Drive is anything uniquely and intentionally related, directly related to our survival. Hunger, thirst, sleep, right? These are things that eventually, like we talked about, you can only go so many sleepless nights before your body will shut down on you. You can only go so long without eating before the cat starts to look tasty. Like you can only, you can only ignore a drive for so long your body doesn't just acclimate to not having now it will adjust like if you're on like a hunger strike or you're in a, a space in the world where food is not readily available eventually your body will need less but it will always need that sex does not apply to that same like it doesn't hit those criteria in the same way now i will tell you there is a very prominent school of thought that psychological drives are a thing like and so we use that same drive language to talk about psychological need right and so a lot of very intelligent brilliant people researchers academics educators will put sex in that category as a psychological drive i after all the thought and research i have done i am very much in the camp of conceptualizing in that way can be harmful to people and it does not meet the all the components to be like a survival drive. So that's, that's where I've made that distinction. But if you were like, no, I'm committed to thinking of it as a drive, a lot of people would back up that school of thought and you could probably find a lot of argument in favor of that. Right. Um, I have a gnat, I'm not crazy. Sorry, there's like a bug. <laughs> right. but if you feel like dancing, then um, we have another anonymous question. Um, anonymous is so curious. curious some of the, some of the others. Um, what's going on with the no fat subculture? 
Fapping is obviously awesome. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I honestly have not done a ton of research into that space. I think that there's a lot of um, overlap in the no fat Venn diagram and the like red pill Venn diagram and the like um, incel diagram. I think a lot of it, those cultures tend to overlap. And I honestly don't know if I can, I can, I can guess, I can guess that it has to do with maybe, um, shame, stigma associated with sexuality. So if you can control those, especially because a lot of it tends to be specifically cis men. And so if we are, if we have taught cis men that this is like a thing they have to have and a thing they have to do, then overcoming that urge is some sort of expression of ultimate masculinity or something. And so I think that there's like some stuff related to that, but I, I'm mostly making like an educated guess. So unfortunately, I'm just not going to be. I do know some people who would be really great to have that talk. Um, so if you go to my website, find my email, email me, I'll send you to those folks. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, right, we've managed to go really far into the Q&A session before having a question from Dave the drummer. Um, he's one of our regulars. And he's the irregular? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm honored. Dave asks, um, is it possible for other parts of the brain to contribute to sexual desire? Like the clever is sexy sort of thing, but actual neurology. Um, all the parts of your brain contribute. It's all working, right? Like your whole, this idea that we only use certain parts of our brain for certain things, like certain parts of our brain process these things, but it's all connected. If like one part of your brain just totally blinked out, everything would be impacted. So it's, it's, it's a lot easier because, God, I'm going to sound like a real dodo right now. <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody out there who give a much more intelligent answer to this. So I'm going to do my best because there are so much, there's so much variance into how people interpret cues as sexually relevant or not really there is, it's very impossible to tease apart which parts of our brain are playing a role in that and which parts are not. All five of our senses are playing a role in that. All of the way we process everything in our environment, that's always going on, whether we're aware of it or not. So, um, yeah, it is definitely possible that there are other parts of your brain. All the parts of your brain are engaged in this process in some way. Do some play a bigger role than others once you figure out what you're into? Absolutely. So if I'm an extremely, if I respond strongly to s visual sexual stimuli, then that part of my brain is going to be more engaged probably, right? The occipital lobe is going to be more engaged in my sexual processing maybe than like, um, you know, it, uh, touch, right? So it, I don't know if that was an answer because I don't know. Yeah. If he wants, if he's still chatting and wants to clarify the question and I did a bad job, I'm happy to try to do better. But <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I think this is probably going to have to be our last question. Um, and it comes from Remy and they ask vaginal lubrication. I'm a biologist yes. and was asked about its origin and I realized I had no idea and I haven't done my homework since. Can you enlighten us? The origin of vaginal lubrication? Yep. Uh, so, um, I'm going to answer what I think is being asked. Um, so I don't know if you mean evolutionarily, but I'm going to just talk about the biological origin, like where it originates in your body. Cause that, I, I'd interpret that question. It's like what, okay. what bit of the vaginal anatomy is. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So, um, we're talking the Bartolin's glands. So all over, um, like all, all over the skin cells, um, externally and then just slightly internally, there's, all these little um, glands, and then at the base, there's your Bartolin's glands here, and all of that is rep is mm, responsible for secretion of vaginal lubrication. So um, I actually have a video on my YouTube channel called the Great Lube episode, where and it's got it's really funny. My husband, the editing was fantastic on this video, <laughs> um, but uh, basically we talk about like your osmolality in your body. So how your body processes like water coming uh, back and forth across your, um, or moisture back and forth across your mucous membranes in your body and the osmolality of outside lubricants or your body's natural lubrication. Um, 
So if I'm extremely dehydrated, my body may respond by not being able to secrete as much lubrication. Um, if I'm taking a med, like people who take Sudafed or like allergy meds and it like dries them up here, it also might dry them up there, that kind of thing. But where it originates in the body is the Bartolin's glands. And then you've got all these other like secretion points all up and down and then slightly internally. And then for um, vaginal ejaculation, so that's a different gland. Those are, that's your skein's gland. And that's internal. I actually have a little pin. It looks it looks a little like a neuron. Um, it's just this tiny little gland. Um, and it is responsible for ejaculatory fluid that is distinct from urine. So some people say, oh, like squirting or ejaculation in women is pee. Now, sometimes there is urine present, but like it is not the same thing. Um, but you're stimulating nerves in the urethra. So sometimes like not like the same as like going to the bathroom, but you might like if you were to sample it. Um, but it's, it's not the same as peeing. So hopefully I answered that person's question. Skeen's gland, Bartolin's glands. That's where you want to do your research. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. That was a really great question and session. And again, yeah. thank you so much for your talk. It was, it was great. Um, and thank you very much to our audience. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have a Zoom call at the end, which you're all welcome to join if you want to keep the social aspect of the evening going. Um, again, we've got loads of talks lined up, so please check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and our website. Um, if you want to make a donation, then please throw some money in our virtual hat via our PayPal link. And Thank you to all of you. Thank you to our speaker, and thank you to the amazing tech team that have made this all possible. So hopefully, hopefully thank see you guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye.